recommend that it's not best for kids, I think. I don't know. Uh, so that's rocking very good. I'm gonna keep that up there and own to. Perfect. Ooh, one person is watching. Oh, I think that's me. I'm trying to find it. Should we shoot 30 views? Yeah. <laughs> Let's get him to 200K. Yeah. Right, right, right. I'd love that. I would love that. That's why I need to get a band, you know, like a little uh, walk, me, yeah. walk me out kind of thing, you know. Kind of thing that'd be the way to go all right folks well uh how's your weekend very good very good uh anything good anything good going on anything interesting happening naomi any, any George, girl. me too oh, wow. oh wow sorry <laughs> <laughs> that's how this works sorry for your loss <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh my God, so did I. <laughs> that is, uh, it's like, that's hilarious. I'm sorry. Right? <laughs> it's like, yeah, this is inappropriate laughter. <laughs> yeah, you've got the same one. What, the same one? No, I don't think so. Oh. I'm sorry for both of your losses. Thank yeah, those are not, uh, it's not how we want to spend the weekend, I'm sure. Have a sure. Uh, so uh, I asked this question with one person and they disagreed, but. Is it the wheels or doors thing? No, it's uh, something actually different. Uh, do you want to know what your belief on? Do you believe? Or what, what is your belief on the question is water wet? Is water wet? Yes. Yes. Why? Uh, I think I think I would say yes because um, I have spilled things on myself that are not water, and I described it as being wet. So water is a property. Of, water has a property of wet, but everything that is has what I would say is wet. It's like it's it's not just water. Okay. But would would you describe like mercury at room temperature as being wet? I would describe it as a carcinogen. Is it toxic? <laughs> Talking metal, let me mean. I would say it's a liquid. I wouldn't say it's wet. What are the properties of water that make it wet? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's wetness. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, solubility. Yeah, it's the polarity, I think, is what, definitely no, I'm part of it. Saying, so, like, solid is in a solid answer, not is it like a steam Yeah, I think, I think the polarity of it, um, the fact that it can dissolve other stuff, a lot of other stuff does it, and the viscosity. Cohe the cohesive and the adhesiveness nature of it. And other things do that differently than water does. Water, we just associate with that more than anything else because there's so much of it, I think. But I have, I have no idea the arbiter, and I don't know if I'm right or if there's a right on this, but it's like, I, I've said, ooh, I got, and fill in the blank on my hand, and it's like, it's wet. So based on the properties that it's cohesive, has uh, cohesibility? Uh, low, vis low viscosity, cohesive, polar. Mildly adhesive, transparent. Because if something was opaque and it got on me, I, I would be like, it's, it's like, I said, like, what the hell is this? So I don't know. It's a good question, though. It's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. All right, folks, are we here? Yes, Min, are you ready? Yeah. Neat. What is it? I thought it was an actual. My <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> hey, fifty-year-old eyes. Don't ruin it. I already ruined it. Don't, don't ruin it. What is it? A star from Bigfoot. It's so cute. We technically no, don't. don't. Oh, okay. <laughs> made out of paper. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We're showing it to the millions of viewers on YouTube. <laughs> streaming this video is what we're showing it to. Um, photosynthesis. Yay. All things photosynthesis. You're going to love it. And what a time of year to be doing that. Um, it's beautiful weather out. Um, the trees are in bloom, Giselle, are they not? Trees. Okay, cool, cool, cool. 
That's good attentiveness for practicing over there. And leaves are starting to show up on the trees as well. Um, so uh, the, the dogwoods have already started the bloom. They're already putting leaves out. The cherry blossoms are already full bloom. I think peak is like now, isn't it, for the cherry blossoms? It's like starting to end of this week. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and they're going to be leafing out pretty soon. The oaks behind uh, my condo are starting to get little buds on them, but they're not even close yet. The, the oaks typically don't leaf out until the middle of April, the big trees. Usually not till the middle of April, but all this appropriate because it is now spring. So welcome to spring. We have passed the equinox, and so days are longer than the nights. Yes. yes, yes, yes. By about a minute and a half by this time. But yeah, so uh, it's now spring. Wonderful, and that goes until the solstice in June twenty first. Is that right? Yes. You are. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> October 3rd, right? October 3rd. Uh, good. So, um, a fun, a, a good time to start a conversation about photosynthesis because, I mean, it's it's a different story when we have this conversation in like November because we're like, I don't, you know? Um, so, we're starting to see a lot more of this photosynthesis that's going to start taking off. And lab is going to be about photosynthesis this week, where you get to learn about and fool with some new delightful equipment called a spectrophotometer. It's going to be fun. And your goal in lab is to experimentally derive the absorption spectrum of chlorophyll. And it's going to be super great. And what makes that super great is that we're going to talk about it uh, today. Like, what is an absorption spectrum? What is chlorophyll? What is what's going on here? What's all this stuff? So, plenty of context today for lab on Wednesday, and then we'll have lab, and then we'll have plenty more context after that, and uh, it's going to be great. And then after this week, we're going to start moving on to um, like the cell meiosis, mitosis, Gregor Mendel, heredity, all that other kind of good stuff. Bigger, bigger, bigger we go. So all we're really doing today with photosynthesis is the opposite of the cellular respiration conversation from last week, right? So that was big, a big part of my thing. It's like you drive the reaction that way, it's respiration, and you drive it that way, it's photosynthesis. So it's like the products of one of the reactants of the other. Yes. Remember that? Yeah. Remember that? Remember that? Cool. And I hope that the respiration lecture that I did last week, the lectures were beneficial to you and serviceable as a learning tool. Giselle, what are you doing? Okay, cool. Oh, sorry. Do you do anything? Like, no, I'm just like poking out at Okay. Do you need anything? Because there's a lot of disinfectant up here. There's like a lot. Gallons of disinfectant up here. And <laughs> surgery done here is disinfectant. Um, let me know if you need anything, Giselle, okay? And, um, so the products of one of the reactants and the other, the way that I tried to do the respiration conversation last week was one where we don't get bogged down in the details of things, um, where it's like, okay, so what does this really mean here? What is this really doing for me? What's really happening with the molecules and the bouncing around of stuff? Because when we think about respiration, like we did last week, we have this glucose molecule and we want to take it apart. And we can take it apart and get a little ATP out of it and end up with lactic acid or ethanol and CO2, that is anaerobic respiration, right? Or if we have mitochondria, we can give that pyruvate to the mitochondria along with some oxygen, and they can do all kinds of stuff with it, where they take all the rest of the CO2 and convert it in, or all the rest of the carbon converted to CO2, take all those energetic electrons out and make ATP out of them using the Krebs cycle and electron transfer chain, right? Awesome. There's infinite amount of complexity that we can go into with any one of those little topics that we talked about. It's like we could do a week on glycolysis. We could do a week on the Krebs cycle. We could do a week on, we could do two weeks on electron transfer chain, right? We can just go hog wild on all of this. But why? It's bio 101. Raise your hand if you're a science major. All right, so like two or three of you, you're awesome. Mid, you know, on the fence, on the fence. Geoscience. Yeah, this is not the last time that you will hear about Krebs cycle and all this other kind of stuff. You'll get to it in a lot of detail when you take like cell or something like that. 
you know? Um, so I want to keep it contextual because we have a lot of people in this class that are not science majors as well. So we want to keep it real. We want to keep it real. So um, when your mitochondria ask for oxygen, it's a good idea to fine, breathe in, give them some oxygen. And they'll say, could you dump the CO2 on your way out? Like, while you're up, can you blow out the CO2? And they're like, okay. Hmm. And you blow it out and then perfect. And then it gets hungry and we feed it glucose and all this other kinds of, kind of good stuff. So that's that. So the question that we're asking this week is how did all that energy get into that glucose anyway? That's the question, right? So if this entire respiration process is getting the energy out of glucose, how do we get the energy in to the glucose to start with? Sound good? Sounds good. Awesome. Um, there's an extraordinarily old biochemical reaction on this earth that does that. It's called photosynthesis. That's how we put the energy in. Now, um, we can think of photosynthesis as a reaction that biological organisms do, and you would be right by thinking that. When we talk about photosynthesis, what we're really, we're not talking about um, an organism, we're not talking even about an organelle. We're talking about a series of reactions, like a reaction series that produces this like end result. And so when we think about photosynthesis, that's sort of what we want to go at. So it's chemistry. We have reactants. We have a product. We have byproducts. We can track the energy. We can track the carbon. We can do all this stuff that leads us down this pathway that ends in this lovely glucose molecule, which Kat is going to eat. And she's going to take it back apart again, get the energy back out, and make a bunch of ATP out of it and things like that. So it's all good. Photosynthesis. If I can move over to the, I brought my green pen, especially for a good reason. And I brought fancy, like, legal-sized wide, widescreen paper. Widescreen paper, you know. <laughs> That's what I thought too when I was grabbing blank paper on the way down. I said, ooh, widescreen. <laughs> widescreen. Giselle, you okay? Yeah. Okay. You still laughing at my widescreen joke? It was the quietest this room's ever been. Okay, um, I want to do a quick little bit of context before I start the details of photosynthesis. So we have glucose, which is C6H12O6, yes? Perfect. Draw it as this nice little hexagonal thing like that. That's a six. And we're going to add to that some oxygen, some O2. I don't need to draw this, do I? Absolutely not. I will. Awesome. Double bond, cool. Glucose and oxygen. Gives us carbon dioxide. CO2, like that. Water. Awesome. Very good, very good. Who took him 11? Anyone, anyone, intro Kim? Naomi, you took. <laughs> uh, how do we balance this thing? You gotta put some numbers up here, right? 
So here's six carbon. So we need a six over here. Everybody clammed up until they realized how easy it is in this case, right? Uh, H12. So we need a six over there. How many oxygens do we have? 12, 18, mm -hmm. six. How many of these do we need? We need six of these as well. So now we have 12. Are we there? I think so. We're close enough. Yeah, we're there. Yeah, we're there. <laughs> We're close enough. We're close enough. We're there. So uh, we can take some glucose and some oxygen. We're going to make carbon dioxide and some water. Perfect. Perfect. What is this reaction that I just drew? What would we just call it? Respiration. It's good. Aerobic respiration. If you said photosynthesis, you were that close. <laughs> you were off by about 10 minutes. I put a happy face on there so the words look balanced across the top. What if I draw this arrow that way? Then we have photosynthesis. So the difference here in whether or not we have aerobic respiration or photosynthesis is which way are we pushing this reaction. So if we load up on this side and have some mitochondria around, it's going to go in this way. If we load up on this side and have some chloroplasts around and some sunlight, it's going to push this way. and We're going to end up making this. So what I keep going back to, it's like the products of one or the reactants of another. This is what I'm getting at. It's like the exact same reaction getting pushed in different directions. All right. So when you think about what life on Earth is, what this life really is, it's, well, things are going this way and things are going this way, and they're balancing each other out. They're balancing each other out. This is part of what we would call, where are my geo-oceanographers, geologists, earth science folks? It's part of the carbon cycle, right? Carbon cycle. Perfect. Carbon cycle is still above. I'm like cartography. It's like what? I'm, I'm doing like cartography. Oh, cool. Okay. Cool. All right. So if we have then um, uh, photosynthesis as a topic, right, of the way that we're going to take some carbon dioxide and some water and turn it into something, and just like blow that up, what do we got? What do we got? So we have a bunch of photosynthesis, CO2, and some water we're going to make glucose and oxygen pushed in this direction over here. OK. Um, we know that glucose has a lot of energy in it. So when we think about what aerobic respiration is doing, we're breaking this thing apart by combining it with something that is super electronegative or oxygen friend, right? And we're having this conversation like, how does all this energy get in to this glucose molecule to start with? We need an energy source for photosynthesis to happen. On a day like this, those energy sources are pretty easy to find. We go outside, and if you look up, which you should not do directly, we have this big, bright thing called the sun. That um, Where does the sun get the energy from? Because remember, our thermodynamic conversations, we can't make energy. We can only like convert it. Right. So where's all this energy come from in the sun, right? Remember what stars are? Sun. 
There are there are engines for making iron. Everything converges into iron or decomposes into iron. Right? So how do you make iron? Well, it's easy. All you need to do is get a couple of stars, you know, <laughs> and a bunch of stuff to fuse, you know, and you know, you start smashing stuff together. Uh, to such density um, that the nuclei start combining together into bigger, heavier stuff up the periodic table. This is the true alchemy, right? Um, the only things that we really know how to do it are, are stars and nuclear reactors, I think. Um, how do you add protons to a nucleus? And it's like, well, it's easy. You take two things and you smash them together so hard um, that the, the repulsion of the electrons uh, no longer have sufficient repulsive power to keep them apart, and you smush them together so hard that the nuclei fuse together. The f the, so we're not talking about electromagnetism here with that kind of thing. We're talking about like ah, smash it together so hard that you move up the periodic table. You move up the periodic it's table. It's just sheer atomic violence. It is atomic violence. It's gravity, right? Which on the small scale is like, eh, not the big a deal. I mean, gravity is by far the weakest of all the nuclear or whatever thermodynamic forces. Um, like by far, it's the weakest. But when you have that much stuff together, it produces such extraordinary force that you get like black holes and supernovas and stuff like that, which is kind of- uh, I remember learning that uh, lightning bolts, when they like come through, they break apart. I forgot what they break apart, but they make a new I think it's nitric oxide. Like they that. make a couple of weird things. They they super ionize what they blow through and so they get like weird nitric oxides and a lot of an ozone, mm -hmm. you know. But they like um, split into the atom or something. They can. That's a lot of juice. Yeah. That's a lot of juice. Like the electrons just like temporarily like blow off of it and then they re sort of recombine a little bit. Yeah. Lightning's got a lot of power behind it. Um, so gravity, it's like a super weak force. You know, one of the four fundamental forces is super weak, but there's so much stuff fusing together that the, the fusion is not really happening in those outer regions of that star. It's really just sort of happening in the core. Um, and everything that's sort of going out from there is like this blowout that's gravitationally sort of pulled in. Because ultimately what a star represents is essentially a codependent abusive relationship. Has everybody ever had like a not so hot of a relationship Anyone? <laughs> I end up a little quicker than I would hope it would. Um, <laughs> where, <laughs> a, a star essentially represents a fight. You know, it's a, it's a it's a it's a it's a fight that lasts about ten billion years, give or take. And uh, you have gravity, which is pulling all this stuff in to the core as hard as it can. Um, nuclear fusion is happening. The word is nuclear. Say it. Nuclear. 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 Um, so far in the nuclear, the nuclei are fusing and a huge amount of energy is released from that. And that's what's essentially pushing outward. So it's like gravity pushes in, the energy released from the fusion is pushing out. And what you see when you look at a star, not through the naked eye, uh, essentially is a negotiation between the forces pulling in and the forces pushing out. And eventually gravity wins because gravity always wins in the end. Um, and... Uh, because it's like, it, it's not hugely strong, but it has a long tail on it, right? It sort of keeps going on <laughs> into infinity, you know? It's like the yeah. In the yeah, yeah, yeah. It, all, it always wins in the end. Gravity always wins. Um, and uh, you start running low on fusible material. Stuff starts to get big and it gets harder to fuse. And you're no longer just fusing little hydrogen, helium, lithium kind of stuff. You're getting up into the metals, you know, after a while. And it's like, the thing just runs out of stuff to fuse and it starts to cool off and all the stuff collapses back in and you have all these hour layers of the star that just like bounce off of the core hard, right? And in that like little fraction of a second, that little fraction of a second where all those outer layers of that star bounce off of the core, that is literally where you get every single thing on the periodic table that is uh, more dense and larger than iron. So everything from Cobalt 27 on up is exclusively made in the supernova of a star. Those fractions of a second when a star dies and all the things kind of crash in. So it's like how much time is spent um, making iron in the universe? 15 billion years. How much time has been made making everything above iron? 
the, com the, the culmination of the fractions of seconds that a supernova is happening. You know, so it's like, well, it's kind of interesting. The universe is big and complicated and mathy. It's kind of neat. It's kind of neat. Kat, you're looking at the periodic table with amazement, yeah, in sheer amazing. amazement. But the cool thing, Kat, is that you have a lot of the stuff um, in you that you rely on that is bigger than iron. You have iodine. You use it as a cofactor for some enzymatic reactions. You don't have too much beryllium in you, right? Uh, you have some of these other things, too, that pop up every once in a while as elements that are useful to use supernova. Supernova. Kind of neat. Kind of neat. Kind of neat. Uh, very good. So um, ultimately, when it comes to photosynthesis, though, the star is really doing nothing more than the law of conservation of mass and energy. And so when um, just garden, in garden variety, nuclear fusion is happening. It's kind of a funny thing to say. Nuclear fusion not being the most garden variety thing you'll ever find. Uh, and these stars, you know, you take this thing, you take that thing, you fuse them together, and things get bigger, right? You get more nuclei, you get more protons in the nucleus, the atom gets bigger. You might be adding shells as you go from uh, helium to lithium. You know, you go up and it's sort of like, now you need three electrons. Instead of, you know, things just kind of get bigger as nuclear fusion happens. What's not, what doesn't happen, though, is if you take two helium, two hydrogen, fuse them together into a helium, the energy level of the helium is less than the energy level of the two hydrogens. It's combined, combined. So it's like take one helium, take one helium, fuse them into, or what, yeah, two heliums and fuse them into beryllium, or two hydrogens and fuse them into a helium. The energy level of the helium is not two hydrogens. It's a little bit less. There's extra energy. Where does it go? Out, right? That's the star. You know, is that little excess energy sort of blowing out? And when I, we use the word energy, the energy level of the helium, the energy level of the hydrogen, what am I talking about? Um, there's this really neat equation, it's super simple, that you can use to measure the energy level of atoms and things like that. I'll write it down here. It's this one. This dude, a hundred years ago, was good at math. He's good at math. Uh, e is energy, 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 energy. right, Aspen? Are you taking? Are you even taking notes, Aspen? I have um, photos. <laughs> M mass, mass in grams. C speed of light, speed of light. Oh, dang. Okay, you're done. Square. <laughs> square. And then you square. You, like, you take the biggest thing and you square it. You know, it's like you don't square the, the, the mass of the gram. You're squaring the, like the, the, the big, right? So what does that tell you about how much energy there is in stuff? Tons. Scads. Well, not tons. Grams. But the, the, <laughs> the speed of light is big, you know? Um, so when we're talking about, well, the sun is huge, how does that much energy come out of it? We're not talking about the power you get from plugging something into the wall. We're talking about big E, big E, right? A lot of energy um, coming out of these things. So much so that you can get a, about a soccer ball size of fizzle uranium or something like that. You can level a medium-sized Japanese city in 1945. That's what we're talking about, you know? Um, you're aiming about the size of a soccer ball will do it. Um, and that was only about five or six percent fusion. The rest of the uranium just blew out from the explosion. So that was about five or six percent energetic conversion in that core on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Less than 10 percent of that uranium was actually converted into energy. Is that wild? So it's like we're talking about a lot a lot of energy in this stuff. That's what's fueling these stars at this fuel. Where are hydrogen bombs capable of? I don't know the details of it, right? But to use hydrogen as a multiplier, right? Is that how it works? Um, but some of these, like the big ones, not the big ones, you know, uh, not the little nuclear bombs, but the big ones, um, they're actually two. It's, it's two, right? It's a 
it's a fusion bomb that fuels a fission bomb, I think. So actually, it's a, it's a big thermonuclear ones. So big and weird. Right. The H bomb. You know. You can make a bomb out of a lot of things on the periodic table. This is why these videos are not marked for kids, right? <laughs> that's why I clicked that box. You know, that's why I clicked it. Not this is not made for kids, by the way. It's not the swearing; it's the destruction potential. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, Jay, I feel like I've been closer on some occasions than I would like to be. You know, so it's like I don't know, I don't know. Um, so this is the energy we're talking about. So we really are talking about, you know, the nuclear leftover, you know, energy coming out of a star that worked its way through space to you or to the plant outside that you then absorb and your energy level, um, not nuclear, but in this case, electromagnetic goes up because we have a little, so it's like when the energy is coming out of the sun and heading towards earth to be used for photosynthesis or to keep you warm on the beach or whatever it might be. What is the thing that's actually moving through space? It's like, what is actually doing the traveling? How is the energy kind of going? How is the energy sort of move? And so energy has a currency. Energy has a currency. And in this case, we're talking about electromagnetic energy because electromagnetic energy is the energy of electrons and covalent bonds and chemistry as we sort of know it. And these things are referred to, I don't know what color to make them, uh, because that's a whole conversation in itself, referred to as the photon. Photons. It's the currency of electromagnetism. So if I want to take some energy and send it over to someone else, I would say, here's some energy. Boom. Boom. That is one photon's worth of energy. I now have less. You now have more. Um, it came out of my outermost electron. It went into your outermost electron. Everything is fine. You can accept that as long as your outermost electron is resonating with the, uh, with the amount of frequency that can accept something of this vibration. Uh, very cool. It's, it's literally currency. It's like give a dollar, take a dollar, you know? So you said uh, photon is the currency of what? Electromagnetic energy. So it's like when, when energy is when electromagnetic energy is moving away from something and going towards somewhere else when it's leaving something and accepting from something else, it does it in a small packetized form called a photon. Is that what happened when we do the little sodium chloride diagram at the beginning of the semester? Because there is like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. maybe. <laughs> that's a, that's an excellent question. We well, here's a here's a good one. Um, if you're ever gonna, who's going to be a teacher? Anybody ever going to teach anything? No one. No one. No one. It depends on how good of a job I do, I guess. Right. Um, this is one that I oftentimes use to get myself out of a jam in a classroom like this. It's like I don't know. You know what? Hang tough. We might answer that in the rest of this lecture. And we'll like never come back to that again. <laughs> we, we might come back to it. Let, let me see if I answer it in the rest of this. So if anybody's ever going to be a teacher, like hang on to that one because it is gold. I'm giving you the good stuff for free. Yeah, yeah, let me draw you a picture. Let me draw you a picture. Um, I, it, it doesn't act like an electron. It's compatible with an electron. So if I wanted to give you energy, in what form would that be? Like if I, me, Paul, wanted to give you, Yasmin, energy, what form would that be? That would be most useful to you where you could accept it and do energetic things with it. Oh, Yeah, it's 100. <laughs> I specifically said teacher. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, 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 it'd be in dollars. It'd be U.S. dollars, right? I mean, the energy coming from me, energy going to you. I now have less of it. You now have more of it. I can't do that stuff with it any longer because it left me. You can do stuff with it because now you have it. It's like that. It, when I say the word currency, it's like it really is the currency. Um, but it's the currency of electrons. You know, the, the U.S. dollar is the currency of, of humans in America and um, a couple of South American countries. <laughs> where, well, it's about it, you know, 
Guam, U.S. Virgin Islands. The Marshall Islands. Yeah, Marshall Islands. Yeah, and a couple, couple others. You know. Um, go ahead. Do photons act as waves or as particles? You, you set me up for these conversations, <laughs> right? Uh, I, I was actually going to get into that in a second. I really was. Um, I can answer that question for you in one word. Yes. Yes. <laughs> You know, I kind of forgot the question. Like, no, Your mind was so blown. Yeah. Uh, See if it comes back to you. See if it comes back to you. All right. So, yes, yeah, asked a good question, though. So, if we have, uh, let's pick an, pick an atom. I don't know. Call the assuming electrons. I'll be here for the. I'll be here all day. I'll be here all day. You want? You really want to watch me draw something? Twenty. <laughs> give me something. Uh, I don't know. I'm trying to think here. Y'all are freaking me out. Hang on. Let me come up with a couple of good atoms here. Give me something small. Um, oh, not carbon. Let's use carbon. Whatever. Right. Uh, it's, it's biology class after all. Six protons is my nucleus. Yes. Yes. Okay, how many in the innermost shell? You see, all of that stuff that we did earlier on in the semester stuck. It really did. You know, and it's like I'm super proud of you guys. I know. Shell. I think you mean you're super proud of the people that actually met. How many electrons are there? One, two, three, I don't know. Something, even I drew that one in a stupid place. I'll put it over here. Um, and I'll draw another one. One, two, three. Great. Two really messy, sloppy carbon atoms right here. Um, so we're not talking about combining this one with this one to make a covalent bond. That's not what we're talking about. We're saying, how do we take energy out of that electron and send it over to this one? So we need to packetize the energy here in some way that lets it be transmittable from one thing to the other. And that is the photon. So we'll go ahead and package some up. And send it over there. This is not, this is not chemical bonding. Right? It is like this energy level of this electron here goes down, the energy level here goes up. Is that how you power like a vacuum? Like, like a vacuum cleaner? Like, like you plug it in and it gets photons? Um, are those whole electrons? Stay tuned. We might answer that. <laughs> 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 Like um, it's a little bit different. That's um, how do you send a current through a wire, right? It, and that's electromagnetism as well, sort of in, in the conduction band of a conductive conductive metal. Um, so it's like you're sending current at that point, um, which spins a thing, which makes that turn, which creates the vacuum, which sucks, you know, kind of kind of stuff. This is the um, sending energy across space without a conductive wire version of it. Right, so um, I'm trying to do two things here. I'm trying to find the cap from this pen. That's the first thing I'm trying to do. Um, I'll find it later. Um, a, a way where you can see this happen is Rebecca Joy's hoodie is red. It's, she, she's the one with the red hoodie. It's right there. <laughs> right there. Right? Uh, who else is wearing uh, a, a color? Nice black shirt right here. Is that black or is that dark blue? Uh, Something with it. Got a black shirt right there. Right? A lovely purple. Um, a hokey, hokey maroon. Hokey maroon right there. A little orange on it too. Just for, just for good measure. Uh, white. White shirt. White shirt-ish. With Is that Vegas? Vegas? Hell yeah. I'd ask you how it was, but you couldn't tell me. A uh, little Lakers jersey in the back. A little yellow. What is that? Black? Nice, nice, yeah. nice. Um, and this is a called Costco gray. What do I call that color? 
blue jeans. I got new. I got new sneakers though that have a yellow sole, so those are super fancy. I don't know. Oh, I know. Okay. Oh, come on. <laughs> 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 Late on. It's like sometimes you get a piece of cake and it's like it's all icing. There's actually no. Cake. <laughs> that's how it was. Um, but when when we but when we, we have these these things that are I had this conversation with my bio one or two class this morning. Um, we were talking about like how do you how do you detect uh, electromagnetic radiation and like as it goes through the environment around us? And it's like stone cold silence the whole time. It's like there's two of them. It's on your face. Light goes into them, right? Yeah, right here. So. Um, when, because that conversation, which was the Bio 102 conversation, their question is, for the homework that the, this week coming up, is convince me that all of this is actually happening. Like, convince me that all of this is actually real. Because um, we're talking about the nervous system and consciousness and how consciousness is built and things like that. So, you know, fun fact, if you take me for Bio 102, coming fall 2022, you will be asked the question, convince me that that this is actually here, you know? And what what tells you that this is here? You know, convince me that this is here. Is there something actually here? What is this thing? You know, and it's like, well, what are you talking about, you idiot? It's a desk, and like, what makes it a desk? And you're like, well, you put stuff on it. And it's like, I put some stuff on it, but I put stuff on a lot of things. Does that make everything a desk? You know, I used to put, I used to put something on my cat. And it's like, oh, because that's what one does. You know, it's like, ooh, I'm going to set it on my cat. And it's like, my cat's not a desk. It's, it, so um, naming something is different than convincing me that something is a real thing. So there's information that comes into your face holes that says, uh, this, I'm seeing something. That information gets stitched with, it sounds like a desk. I mean, it, it makes desk sounds. That sounds like a desk. You know, it's like, not much else makes that sound. It sounds very dusky to me. It's like, it smells like a desk. And you don't want to know what it does. I'm not going to taste it. Um, but it's like it has the tactile qualities of deskiness. You know, it's kind of dusky. Kind of dusky. Um, so, you know, I have, you know, pressure waves going into my ears that are kind of specific. I have electromagnetic radiation going into my eyes that are kind of specific. The magical thing that consciousness and the brain does, it stitches them all together into a uniform experience that says they're all the same thing. It's a coalescence, right? It coalesces all these multiple sources of information to this one thing that says, ah, desk, ah, desk. But the question is not, is this here? We can all say, yes, no, is that desk there? Yeah, yeah it is, okay, so great. There's something here, I guess, that we're calling a desk. The question that is interesting is where is the desk? But your ability to see does not extend any farther than your ability to put things together in your brain. So nothing that is actually happening outside of yourself is actually something that you're actually in detection of. The entire universe around you is built here. Yes, pretty much. Nothing exists outside of your eyes, right? Until it's seen. Because it's like you're you're building this in your head based on the information that's coming in. Yes. Is everybody okay with that? Sort of a matrix moment. I was it was described earlier. Cat question? Um, topic of sight, is that how like your brain feels in the spots that your eyes aren't seeing? Like if you're seeing a movie or something and there's somebody blocking the screen, you can see around. Fun fact. You ready for this one? Yeah. Your brain does not just fill in the things that are not there, your brain fills in everything. That's all there is, is your brain filling in. Okay. Do you need like peripheral vision? So, wait. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so it's like your brain is not just filling in your, your blind spot, your brain is filling in everything. Everything is your brain filling in. Based on the information that's coming in. All get stitched together into something that's in here that you're saying is based on my stitched together multimodal mathematics of my brain. There's something 
that I will point to in this direction that looks like it has the properties of deskiness to it. But it's not actually exist, it doesn't exist outside of your consciousness okay. in the form that you see it in. Right? Okay. I mean, obviously, you've known this since you were in third grade. Totally. You talk about this in elementary school. Yeah. So I also heard about something about, uh, about images in your head, like like when people have dreams and like about like certain people, like they, they've never seen them, but your brain doesn't have like the capacity to make up images that so it's never seen. seen. Exactly, you've seen the person before, yeah, but like the future. you just don't remember seeing them. Like you may have seen them like, like a crowd. Yeah, a crowd or on a video or on a movie, and they were just. I don't know. Sure. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard to test. I don't know. It's hard to test. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, hey, you're the dude from Trader Joe's. What are you doing? <laughs> 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 this is starting to sound off with those paper <laughs> Yeah, right, right. <laughs> um, that's why this class is not getting kids. <laughs> What's in front of you is not accurate. <laughs> None of it's accurate. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 no. None of it is. <laughs> um, well, it, there's, there's not a right answer. Like, convince me this is real. It's like, you, you can't? It's a trick question, right? Yeah, it's a simulacra of, of unrealized potential hopes, dreams, lies, and, and then again, right? And this goes down the, the matrix hole a little bit, and that's sort of fine. But it also sort of doesn't matter. It's like you, you can't get hung up in this because no matter what all of this is, no matter what's happening in your brain, whatever, no matter what reality is being constructed, you're stuck here participating in it. So you might as well just be nice to each other, right? It's like eat a good meal, have some tacos, get a good night's sleep. Don't take anything too seriously because no, I mean, none of this is actually anything more than what's being stitched together up here in, in a weird way, in a weird way. Um, we can test that hypothesis. Do you want to do it? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So, and that's great because this is exactly where I'm going with this conversation about. Did you with that? I, I, everything builds up to the last day of Bio 102. All right, so um, the big thing that I'm trying to lead us all up to is uh, what is the nature of, of light and color? All right, and so when I have multicolored pens up here, what makes the orange one orange? What makes the yellow one yellow? What makes the green one green? What makes the purple one purple? These are also the basis of the hypotheses that we're testing in lab on Wednesday when we do the absorption spectrum of chlorophyll. When you go outside and you look at a tree and the leaves are on it, you say, ah, green. Right? Right? I mean, so it's like, what's going on here with the nature of energy, photons, leaves, photosynthesis, and green? What, so what, what's going on with that is sort of the question. And what wavelengths get absorbed and which don't? And that's a slightly different question than when we're sort of poking at. We really are just sort of poking at this. We're spending more time than we need to just because A, it's fun. B, Giselle would rather do nothing else. C, <laughs> it's somewhat interesting from a philosophical point of view because it sounds complicated and it's college, right? But this whole notion that your entire existence is built inside of your own head and there's nothing more to any of this than your own per perception about what's happening most of the time we do that based on consensus with each other if we go outside and look at the leaves the leaves are green and we're all going to say oh great those leaves are green and we're all going to go about our happy way never mind the fact that we're all seeing a different color when we look at that based on what our neurology is doing but we all say it's green occasionally uh, cracks up here in the reality around us and um, fights emerge because um, groups of people have a hard time discovering the consensus based on what the shared image of reality might be. And the best case I've ever seen of that is... 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 The dress. Is the dress. Oh, so... <laughs> So, 
Because that thing is black and blue. Yeah. Fight, yeah. fight amongst yeah. yourselves. Yeah. Fight amongst yeah. yourselves. Yeah. Right? Okay, like put a long yeah. 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 It's like electric teaching and the class teaches itself. Now we're going to just argue with each other. It's like, but like I've never argued. That. Normally, I say it's like. I love it. your face right now is like. Oh, you said the yeah, I mean it's. It, it will eternally occupy this rare and special place in, in, in cultural history as one of those times where people could not feel the same shared reality from an observation. Yeah, you're just staring at like how there's like a white. I feel like when they say that, you're just trying to like. You're right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I well, it's an interesting use of the word opinion. Yeah, 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 yeah. So hold on. those are three completely different questions, aren't they? It's like so there's there's the way that you see it, but everybody else is your opinion, right? But yours is truth, right? Right? Right, right? Because no, Kat, you're absolutely right. You see what you see. You see what you see. Right? And what, what do you see, Kat? I see white and gold. White and gold. I see what it goes too. Yeah. Look at the top. Well, of the the so it's like all the all the black and blue, you know, seers out there. What is that? Yeah, I can see that. You know what's crazy? I see the yellow. So there's a couple of interesting. Okay, so there's a couple of interesting things going on. Here. Uh, what's what are the options? So who sees black and blue? You see, you're not. Nuts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I'm all right. Oh and what's the other one? That's it's white. Like who sees white and gold? Okay. Now I'm gonna make. I'm, I might on a on a with a with a lot of people. In the room, there's better odds of this. I might make a couple of people pretty happy with what I'm about to ask. Who sees light blue and gold? I can see. I got it. It's like, like this is like some light sky blue color, and this is like a goldish trim. Yeah. It's like a shadow. It's like a bushy Okay. It's not. That's light blue, and that's gold. It's just really bad. And it sure as hell is in black and blue. And it sure as hell is in. This is like this light bluish, sky blue kind of thing. The highlighted parts at the very top. The highlighted parts of the thing that is clearly gold? Yeah, no, no, the right side, the left side. Yeah, the blue. The blue? The blue? A little bit over. When you say that, that's like a different shade, though, to the right. And the top is like. I'm not trying to make you go insane, Kat, but it might actually be. It's like a smaller left corner, very top. Up here? A little bit less, a little bit up. Like it's like an inch to the left. Yes. Yeah, it's blue. It's like blue. I'm yeah, I see like a bright white. Bright white? It's like a dark school shadow. Oh, what is it? Like a dark school shadow. 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 Like a dark Like a dark school shadow. 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 So the question is like, what does someone who's colorblind see? What? what? Is it an African? I'm talking about like, after you can like drag your cursor over the specific color so that you can drag. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. right, right, right. Like the color, the colors, the color selectors. Yeah. Well, yeah. then it, it's which color scheme you're using. Are you using like HSD or using RGB? Yeah. Okay, yeah. see. Yeah. yeah, right, right. Um, right. I don't but, <laughs> but I mean, the awesome thing about all of this is that. You know, people have very different answers to the question about what color is distress. And you are all absolutely correct in what you said. Well, right? It's just that. Some are wrong. Your brain. <laughs> <laughs> everybody, everybody either, right? um, the, the brain does different things with the information as it comes in. Right? So 
here is, is one of these wonderful cases of the reality around us is built not as it is, but up here. And we can all sometimes come together on that and everything is fine, but sometimes we don't. And there's a there's the uh, the audio version of this. What is it, the Gani Laurel? Yeah, Gani. Well, that's like a hearing of like which death school. I got that turned out to be doctor. Uh, it's it it seems to work the same way the dress does, but it's like a on on audio, audio or, oral kind of version of it. Or the U A O L version of it. Yeah. So it's kind of neat, kind of neat. But this speaks to this whole notion of color and what it is. So it's like what is having established firmly the fact that reality and color and appearance and all that kind of stuff is built in your head, what is the origin of the light that is getting in there that you are interpreting in the first place? What is the, what is the origin of the light here? Right? And in this case, it's that thing, this projector in the ceiling, and the light is coming out of there, hitting this, going back to your face, right? Going into your eyes, and in your brain, and your brain is saying, okay, I'm gonna stitch this together into this three-dimensional thing, or two-dimensional thing in this case. And uh, it's obviously, I, from what I'm getting in, and what looks like around it, and the situation and the context and my history, and my experiences, and the way I'm wired, and the brain chemistry, and all this other kind of stuff, um, I'm gonna say light blue and gold. Perfect. Can we, can we turn off the light? So the only there are, you can do this by the way you can you, if you can look at this thing for long enough and you can flip your brain into seeing a different combination oh, no, no, no. it's not easy to do it takes a little concentration but you can do it you can like make yourself see other colors yeah it's still, still blue and gold yeah <laughs> I was able to like once or twice force myself into seeing it as the black and black and dark. The black is so like Mind blown. Mind blown. It all looks black now, right? <laughs> Unconscious. Um, very good, very good, very good. So, uh, but when we talk about like these photons as the currency of electromagnets, is when we're going back to where we started this with, you know, red hoodies and Rebecca's red hoodie and black shirt and purple shirt and huge water bottle that is. A couple of different colors on it, purple on the top, orange on the bottom, and uh, your black hoodie if you have on and the white shirt. What's actually happening here? And so what we have, multi-energy photon light is coming out of the light and it's bouncing off of all of the surface around us. And some of it's being uh, absorbed and the energy level is going up. Some of it is being reflected back out again or passed through. Whatever goes back out and hits your eyes is sort of what you see. So here's Rebecca Joy's white, or sorry, red hoodie back here. Yes? Yeah, look at it. Look at it. Look at it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I get looked at for an hour and 20 minutes at a pop. So um, cool. So what color is the hoodie? Red. You know, so it's like obviously it's red. I don't think there's too many people who disagree, but it's like it's black and gold. <laughs> Blue, no, black and blue, white, and blue. um, it's red, and uh, so all this light, you know, but the light coming out of the out of the fluorescent bulbs up here is not just red. It's got tons of different colors in it, and when you get all kinds of different wavelengths of photon coming out of this, then we see white, right? It's like your brain stitches together. It's like, okay, there's a lot going on here. We're just going to make some white out of that. Um, if you have a super color absorbent top on, it's like, all I do is take, I never give anything back in return, that's where we get the black colors, right? Um, it's absorbing all of the different energy levels and nothing is left to bounce back out again. So my brain doesn't know what to do with it, so it's like, there's nothing actually there. So it's gonna make this color that we call black, which is the absence of color. Yes. White being all colors, what does one do with red? So clearly, the color of your hoodie can only 
be of what it is from the photons of multispectral light that are coming out of the bulbs. What is being absorbed is everything but red. Your hoodie does not do a good job of absorbing red. It does a good job of absorbing everything but red. So if you want to be kind of dorky and nerdy and hang out in the quad and try to trip people up, it's like, your hoodie's not red, your hoodie's every color but red. Or it's like, it reflects red and it absorbs everything else. So that's when you get in those kind of stupid conversations, which although technically correct, are obnoxious. <laughs> or obnoxious. Um, so there's that. So when you go outside and look at the, at, the, at the leaves on the trees and say these leaves are green, and then have a conversation about chlorophyll and energy levels and all that kind of stuff, the energy source would be the sun. That's where the light is coming from. Yes? Yes. Light comes down, hits leaf. Leaf absorbs a lot of stuff, but not the green. The green is kind of left out. Uh, for the middling energetic molecules that it is, that's what you're left to see and see you do. Oh, look at the pretty green leaves. Isn't it true? Well, actually, I really don't know, but um, like butterflies have like a special type of vision where they can see like more things like in depth. Most insects do. Most insects do. Most insects do. No. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, for for an insect like a. Bees, you know, bees, flies, these butterfly, whatever, like, it's like, I, I could not think of a single bug there for a second. It was like, I don't know, bees. Um, uh, when looking at a flower, you get stuff that looks a little different than what you and I might, might see. So it's like, here's the middle of the flower. Stem, obviously. What color do you want this flower to be? Red. Red? Green. Pink. <laughs> I don't know. Flower, right? Um, you look at it and you see something like that. If you are an insect, uh, so what do you want to do? What are you going? Why are you going after this flower? What are you trying to do? It's like you're trying to get the pollen, which is. Here, while it's actually you're trying to get the yummy, sappy, nectary goodness, because it has a lot of glucose in it. Um, and so you land right there, and there's also a lot of pollen in here. This is a place to be, right here. So if you're an insect looking at this uh, flower, kind of looks like that. Where should I land? Just like, it's right here, you know. Um, but you don't see that light, right? Um, insect eyes are dialed up to see those wavelengths a little bit more than, than you do. I have a question. Um, you know, like a cat can see, like, not just a cat, but like different animals can see stuff that humans can't. It's on the spectrum. The undead? Huh? Mm -hmm. no. Like ghosts and stuff? Oh, you, mean at night? you know, like ghost adventures? Whoa. Yes. Like where you go out with like the FLIR camera and you're like, there's a ghost. Yeah, it could be like animals that like, are out of the spectrum yeah. Oh, good question. Yeah, there's, there's um, there are some. Um, who's into horror novels? Anyone? Um, there was a uh, spectacularly racist science fiction author about 100 years ago, H.P. Lovecraft. H.P. Lovecraft. Such you know, <laughs> you know like, yep. Um, such wonderful films as Reanimator. Uh, things kind of be rate. Uh, the films that were made of his works were kind of B-rate. Um, uh, he's been well canceled already, so it's like, <laughs> it's like yeah, yeah, totally racist guy, totally racist guy. Uh, but it's, you know, it, it's, it, was, it was more than just like, well, it was a different time. It was just like, it's not that. It's like it was over. over you know, it's like people even back then. Yeah, I thought he was racist. That's saying something, you know. And um, he had stories about that. You know, that there are things out there that are existing sort of polyphasic to us that exist contemporaneously with us that are just outside of our ability to perceive for no other reasons than just scientific eye kind of stuff alone. So some sci-fi tried to hit at that about 60 or 70 years ago. Um, it's a curious question, though. 
curious yeah, question. Like it's like, that, it's yeah, they look around. It's like, what are they looking at? Yeah. And it's like, your dog just stares at the wall for an hour. It's and it's like, she barks at like nothing. Oh, like, what, what do you see? What are you seeing up here when you do that? H. Howard Phillips Lovecraft. H. H. P. Lovecraft. Howard Phillips. He wrote a million books, so you won't have a hard time. He lived in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. Of course. Um, <laughs> and yet he had a terrible fear of the oceans. Yeah, and he, his fears were the basis of much of his work. You know, um, the film Hellboy is primarily H.P. Lovecraft inspired. No. Right, the ancient ones, right, the Hellboy series. Um, there's a few other, you know, he shows up, uh, his big thing, Call of Cthulhu, yeah. the name of which is technically impronounceable by the human tongue. It's like Cthulhu, C T H U H L U, or something like that. It's like he says in the he says actually in the book that's like it's not actually pronounceable using the human. Yeah, there's several ways <laughs> that people spell it. Yeah, but the um, the Hellboy franchise is probably the one that is most commonly as, as a Lovecraft thing. We can talk about that. It's like so there. I I mean it's not that. I mean, there, there absolutely is a huge amount of information out there that you have no access to, either because it's above or below the visible spectrum, it's above or below the audible spectrum. Um, it's just there, you just don't have access to it. Your dog and cat probably do. Um, some other animals definitely do. Um, but it's uh, your, your window on the world is not as wide as you think it is. That sounded very ominous the way that I said that. Oh, which is awesome. There's more to your world than meets the eye. Yeah, there's way more to your world than meets the eye. That's for sure. Um, and that doesn't that doesn't imply the supernatural as we are. But you know, it might be that too. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. You know, we'll see. Is that a hand up or a? Yes. Okay. Um, unrelated to that, but still related to the topic of like color spectrum and like seeing. I love that we tried to relate these things to the <laughs> topic. I try to keep it somewhere like. Um, yeah. uh, so I know that military ships at nighttime they use red lights in the hallways and stuff so that when you leave and you're like on deck you can actually like your eyes don't have to Yeah, you don't have to do the, the light, light. Just, like, so, yeah. map yeah. see everything. Yeah. Why don't we do that like anything else? Like, um well we do. We do. Um, there's somebody's patio on the walk that I take around the neighborhood that has a red light on the patio. <laughs> That hardly counts, though, but that's a good question. Like phones, I know, like, if you turn your phone on in the middle of the night, it's, like, super bright, your eyes, like... Yeah, there's a night, you know, night shift on your eye. Yeah, but it doesn't count that much. Yeah, it really doesn't. I just tried. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was worth something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Really yeah. but, but, Ted, I mean, if you've ever been in one of those environments where it's just, like, the red light of a military ship hallway or something yeah. like that, um, the colors of things are different than they than they are another... It, it, it does, because it's, like, all of a sudden... You know, Rebecca's red hoodie is no longer red. It's grayish, you know, or the, your shirt is no longer white. It's something else. You know, you, the only colors you can present to the world are the ones that can work with, absorb, reflect, energize down or, or whatever, the, the photons that sort of come in, right? So, you know, all these things we refer to as a pigment. A pigment is anything that selectively accepts or rejects a photon and kicks it out of something else or absorbs it. You know, so when we talk about what that leaves are doing out on those trees, it's a conversation about the pigments that a living organism is using to accept or reject photons of light as they come in. And you, you would think that natural selection would do a good job of this, and it does a pretty good job, but not all wavelengths are created equal. Not all photons are created equal. Some of them have higher energy levels than others. And if you want to think about these things as a conversion or a currency exchange between one energizing thing or one energized thing sending energy to something else, the sun to a leaf or something like that, you would think that the tree would spend most of its time and energy and natural selective prowess to try to make sure that it got the high power, high energy stuff first. And then it's like the other stuff is kind of fine. And I sort of analogize this to the uh, to the you go out to eat for dinner analogy. You know, it's steak night at the Ponderosa or whatever it is. I mean, Ponderosas are still around. Ponderosa steak, I don't know. And it's like, you get this, you, you get steak, uh, some rice peel off or a pasta for a side um, and, a, and a salad. It's like, if, you're, if your objective is calories 
and you and and getting as much as you can. It's like which is the most valuable thing to you here? The steak, the rice, or the or the, or the salad? Steak. The, yeah, go for the steak. You know, it's like that's where the stuff is. Yeah, you know, and it's like the pasta that'll do. It's okay. The rice on the side. It's like some of the steamed vegetables. Like that's fine, but it's not the steak. And the salad, I'm only going to eat that if there's like cheese and blue cheese dressing and other cool stuff on it. Because who likes lettuce? You don't make friends with salad, right? So a philosopher named Cobra Simpson said that once on <laughs> an episode of You Don't Make Friends with Salad. Um, but it's true. You don't make friends with salad, right? I mean, if you, if you show up to somebody's house, you're not going to show up with a head of iceberg lettuce and, on, on potluck night, you know? So you have to... Yeah. You have to bring something else along with you. Yeah, so um, in in um, lab on Wednesday, we are going to take apart some leads, and we're going to run it through a spectrophotometer, and we're going to find out what wavelengths of photon it absorbs, preferentially over others. The results might surprise you. And um, then in lecture, we'll talk about what photosynthesis actually is, like where in the leaf it's happening, how does it work, and how does this resemble, in most ways, if not all, um, a turn of the century industrial revolution like textile mill, right? A lot of the principles of, of old factory processes are manifest in the light and dark reactions of photosynthesis. So good? So good? I have not yet posted a thing, uh, but I will. But, you know, it's like I'm not hugely interested in, like, assigning a lot of homework. So, like, like... I might assign a, a podcast to listen to, which I stumbled across pretty interestingly and recently, which you might like, um, about one of the key enzymes of photosynthesis it's called Robisco. And if you want to make a zillion dollars, that's the one you want to study. This is a different one. This is, it's called Robisco. It does a cool thing in photosynthesis that is fundamental to, it's like one of those big 10 makes life on earth possible enzymes, Robisco. Rubisco. Yes. Like Nabisco, like the Keebler elves, Nabisco, but with an R, Rubisco. How about Crisco? That's a different one. <laughs> yeah. that's, a, that's the large conversation. Crisco <gasps> is vegetable. It is vegetable, but it's like it's a, it's a large conversation, <laughs> right? Large. Um, it's, it's a large conversation, but it's like it's a plant based version of large. Yeah. Crisco, yeah. <laughs> large. One, two, two. Bye. One, two, three, five, buddy. Hey, Jay.